Europa. Pardon? Harvey Lee Snyder, born in Philadelphia, studied piano for 10 years and earned a BA in music at Columbia College, New York. He worked in various capacities for the League of New York Theaters, Columbia Record Club, Mercury and Philip, Phillips Records, and Mills Music. For the Record Club, he wrote an illustrated history of American popular music, and he wrote album notes for Spoken Arts, Cadman, Mercury, and Columbia Records. In retirement, he took up writing full-time and returned to his roots in music. Afternoon of a Fawn is his first published book. He lives with his wife Carol in Malvern, PA. Harvey Lee Snyder. That would be Carol Baker. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. These glasses are better for reading. <laughs> well, good evening. I want to thank Thea Katroba for asking me to speak today, and uh, thank you all for being here. Very happy to see you all. Uh, my book, as you know, is about Claude Debussy, whom I consider the most important French composer of the 20th century. I don't know that there are too many other contenders. It's not the usual biography. I wrote it for readers, not scholars, although it involved years of research, and I hope adds something new to the Debussy story. I cover the biographical highlights, but without the day-to-day -day details. I write about the music, but without the jargon. On another level, the focus is historical. Uh, how Debussy invented modern music at the same time and place, Paris in the uh, 1890s, that the symbolists were creating modern literature and the post-impressionists were on the verge of modern art. That's <coughs> Excuse me. That's modern with a capital M. <clears throat> the subtitle of my book is How WC Created a New Music for the Modern World. And that's what I'll talk about today. The how and the why. <clears throat> I'll run quickly through his biography so you can put things in context. He was born in 1862 near Paris. His name was Achille Claude or Achille. His parents called him Shiloh. His parents were poor. They had, very, uh, they had no formal education at all. And they had no interest in music, as far as I can tell. Although I, I read that his father knew how to whistle. <laughs> um, his mother kept him at home and taught him what she knew, which was probably very limited. His father, Manuel, was often unemployed, an unreliable breadwinner in a country that really loved bread. So I don't know what they did. In 1870, there was a disastrous war with Prussia, then a workers' rebellion that led to a governing, to a governing commune uh, in 1871. Achille's father joined the National Guard, which supported the commune. And when the commune was overthrown, I don't know if I can lift this. Uh, he, um, when the commune was overthrown, his father was captured and put in a horrible place called Satori, where thousands of soldiers were dying of their wounds and sickness and starvation. At Satori, Manuel met a fellow prisoner called Charles de Sivry and told him that his son played piano. And he was really stretching the truth there because um, Achille had piano lessons the pre prior year for one month. His teacher was a violinist. And the violinist told his family that the kid had no, no talent for music. So that was the end of his lessons. But his father's telling this stranger that his son plays piano. Now, Manuel was tried and condemned to four years in prison. Charles de Sivry was released and went home. And he told his mother, for some reason, that he had met somebody, another soldier, whose boy plays the piano. Nobody knows why he said that. 
except that his mother was a sometime music teacher. Her name, very grand name, was Madame Antoinette Flor Motet de Fleurville. She was a fine pianist. She claimed to have been a pupil of, the, of uh, Chopin. And she asked to hear Achille play. So the boy played for Madame Motet, and she was impressed. She volunteered to give him lessons, free. And she must have been a fabulous teacher, because after only one year with Madame Motet, Achille won entry to the Paris Conservatory, the best music school in, in France. He was barely 10 years old. His teachers would groom him for a career as a concert pianist. In his first years, Achille didn't do so well at the conservatory. His teachers recognized that he had a special feeling for music, um, but he wasn't practicing very much and he never won prizes for piano. And uh, after a while, they told him to find another career path. He could stay at the conservatory, but maybe he'll be a music teacher. Um, so in, in this new uh, track, he studied harmony, composition, the other disciplines, and he did well despite his discomfort with, with what he was being taught. Um, the res particularly the restrictions on what a composer could do and could not do. But anyway, when he was 21, he won a Prix de Rome, which was a, a very important prize in France, especially at that time. It's France's highest honor for young composers. The government would subsidize a two-year residence in Rome at the Villa Medici, which is quite a place. All expenses paid. It was like winning the Heisman Trophy. Your country expected a lot from you after that. What we need to understand is this. At the conservatory, Debussy was trained to write music more or less the way Mozart and Beethoven were trained. The way Schubert, Bizet, Grieg, Tchaikovsky, Stravinsky, Dvorak, they all learned the same rules of harmony and counterpoint and orchestration and so on. The rules were sacred. It was like Bible study at a fundamentalist seminary. You just don't question it. You write music a certain way, and originality was not encouraged. Of course, Beethoven broke a few of the lesser rules, and I'm sure his critics were unhappy about it. Franz Liszt and Richard Wagner uh, ignored some of the dogma. But for Debussy, their music had so much in common that in his ears there wasn't much difference between the music of Mozart in 1780 and Brahms in 1880. There wasn't much difference between Grieg in Norway and Tchaikovsky in Russia. They all wrote music in the same way. What differentiated them one from the other was not what they learned at the conservatory, but the singularity of their imagination and the strength of their courage to write something a little different. W.C. knew whatever he writes, it won't sound like Mozart. It won't sound like César Franck or Jules Massenet, who both taught at the conservatory. He knew this even as a teenager. It wasn't the language in which he could speak music. Imagine James Joyce forced to write like Dickens, or Cézanne with no paints, only charcoal. It would have been very hard for him. And in Europe, there was no other musical language, so Debussy had to invent one, and he hadn't the foggiest idea how to do that. In my book, I have a chapter called The Tyranny of Richard Wagner. It's a long digression, but it's necessary to understand the dilemma that Debussy and other composers of his time faced. For decades, Wagner's powerful music dominated the opera stages of Europe. Operas like Lohengrin, Tannheiser, The Meistersinger, Tristan and Isolde, Parsifal, and so on. Composers didn't know what to do, how to write, how to be heard over the clamor of audiences calling for Wagner. Some composers tried to imitate Wagner, 
not just in their operas, but their symphonies and chamber music, too. They failed miserably. Ernest Chausson said Wagner made him feel like an ant that comes up against a big slippery rock in his path. And there was the terrible fact that Wagner was German. Germany and Austria had dominated European music for hundreds of years. The music that was taught in all the conservatories was uh, tradition, uh, German tradition. The French hated the Germans. This was after the humiliation of the Franco-Prussian War. The French were made to feel like a second-rate nation. They hated Wagner most of all. He was an overbearing egomaniac, an anti-Semite who set himself up as the face of the German people. The composer Eric Satie told his friend Achille, who by this time preferred to be called Claude, that the French needed their own music, music that didn't owe allegiance to the Germans and Austrians. Music without the sauerkraut, he said. <laughs> Debussy had already come to the same conclusion. Debussy said that Wagner was a beautiful sunset mistaken for the dawn. Wagner was not the start of a new day in music. He was the end of an era. So that's why Debussy had to create a new musical language. It was because he couldn't express himself within the sacred boundaries of traditional tonal harmony. It was because somebody had to knock Wagner off his pedestal. And I think it was later that he was driven by a desire to restore the musical eminence of France, which had been lost after the Baroque era. So now, how did he do it? A new musical language. It was almost like inventing the wheel. And he didn't know where the spokes were or what they'd be made of. So we're going to talk about the spokes of the wheel. What can be done beyond Tristan? That's how Debussy framed his dilemma. The answer to that question forms the major part of my book. Uh, to start, he looked for inspiration not to his predecessors and contemporaries, but to the music of Asia and Russia, the music of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and the Baroque. In 1889, Paris ho hosted a World's Fair, an international exposition, to celebrate the centennial of the storming of the Bastille. They put on a great show on a huge tract of land that centered around the enormous iron tower that Gustav Eiffel built for the occasion. There was also a massive iron building housing the latest industrial achievements from all over the world. Edison brought his phonograph machines. Alexander Bell had his telephones there. Around the fairgrounds, there was food and music and art and entertainments for many countries. Buffalo Bill and Annie Oakley were there with their Wild West show, and they were very popular. There was also what was known as a human zoo, a terrible name. It was an agglomeration of dozens of little villages where small communities of brown people and black people, mostly from the colonies, pretended to go about their daily lives in full view of millions of white Europeans. In the human zoo was a group from Java who introduced Europe to the gamelan. A gamelan is a group of musicians playing gongs and bells of many sizes, stringed instruments, wind, wind instruments, percussion and singers and dancers. W.C. went to the fair many times just to hear the gamelan. It thrilled him. It was a revelation. Here was a musical language completely different from his own. Exotic sonorities, intricacies and nuances, rhythmic patterns of unusual complexity, nothing remotely like the tonal harmony of Western music. The gamelan provided Debussy not only with proof that other musical languages existed, but also with techniques that would extend the possibilities of his musical expression. The great Russian composer, Modest Mussorgsky, had died in 1881, but his music was still almost unknown in Western Europe. A friend of Debussy got hold of the score of Mussorgsky's opera, Boris Godunov, and Debussy found there a new way to write vocal music, 
with a different kind of declamation. It led him in his opera Peleus and Melisande to write melodies that followed the speech patterns of the French language, the rhythms and gentle inflections without flourishes. <clears throat> it was a new thing. France had been singing music for centuries that was more suited to the German tongue or the Italian than their own. <clears throat> Jean-Jacques Rousseau in the 18th century had argued that France ought to have a naturalistic way to sing, but it was left to Debussy more than a hundred years later to discover it. I need a water break, folks. Sorry. <clears throat> In the 19th century, Europe discovered in their old monasteries thousands of dusty manuscripts of medieval liturgical music. They revealed the church modes, as they came to be called. The church modes were not a complete surprise, but now they were studied with a new fervor. The modal scales were variants of major and minor, and they gave Debussy a legitimized way to break some of the rules of harmony because he could now use unfamiliar scales and create new sounds. He loved Spanish music, particularly the folk music of Andalusia, which typically is based on one of the church modes, the Phrygian, or variants of it. And he wrote some of the most exciting Spanish music of his time. Spain's great composer, Manuel de Falla, said that Debussy had caught the essence of Spain despite his lack of Spanish blood or direct experience. Then there was Eric Satie. We know him best for his three gymnopédies, which are almost ubiquitous today on radio and television. Years ago, they would have been considered elevator music. You would have heard them on all the elevators. Uh, but set in piano pieces like the Sarabands, written around 1888, Satie used strange, dissonant chords of the seventh and chords of the ninth in ways that had rarely been heard before. Chords and chord changes that sounded like an early precursor of modern jazz. These chords became immensely important to Debussy, who used them extensively and with a sophistication that Satie was incapable of achieving. Besides the church modes and the pentatonic scale, which he borrowed from the gamelan, Debussy began to use the whole tone scale as well. Every step of the scale is a whole tone, no half tones, giving music a vague, unsettled character because it has no key, no resting place. The whole tone scale became a signature element, <clears throat> especially in Debussy's middle period. At first, he was loudly criticized for it, because it was a total rejection of the fundamentals of traditional tonal harmony. Nearly all of Debussy's musical discoveries that I've mentioned were internalized by the early 1890s. But a little later, there were, there were non-musical elements too that made their way into his music. For example, art, painting, not the Impressionists, though Debussy has, <coughs> has always been called a musical Impressionist, he studied instead the work of the American James Whistler, who could find beauty and drama in the darkest, murkiest corners of the evening. And he looked to the English painter, J.M.W. Turner, who could paint blazing sunlight on his canvases. W.C. wondered, could I do things like that in music? He drew inspiration from nature, too. He once said he had made the mysteries of nature his religion that the whole expense of nature was reflect, expanse of nature was reflected in his soul. He said the secret of musical composition was in observing the sound of the sea, the outline of a horizon, the wind in the leaves, the cry of a bird. Somebody quipped that if the grass could be heard growing, W.C. would have set it to music. So now we have Whistler's darkness and Turner's brightness and all of nature, and we're on our way to a music that has a visual component, which I found at the time was a strange thing. In his new musical language, 
WC gave us many, many tonal pictures. Some are almost like soundtracks for a silent movie running in your head. He gave us children playing in the rain, a lonely person slogging through a heavy snowfall, a child's stuffed elephant, even fireworks on Bastille Day. He captured the slow passing of clouds through the night sky in nocturnes, the many moods of the ocean and winds in La Mer. But La Mer was written in 1904 and 5. I want to get back to the early 1890s, to Afternoon of a Fawn, because that's the key that unlocked the door to modern music, and it's the centerpiece of my book. W.C. was the most literary of all composers. Beginning at the conservatory, he took it upon himself. Remember, he was homeschooled, and I don't know whether he knew anything about literature before he was maybe 15 or 16 at the conservatory. But he was reading the great novels and poetry of 19th century France and translations of Dickens, Shakespeare, and especially Edgar Allan Poe. He had already set to music dozens of poems by Verlaine, Banville, and Baudelaire, when in 1890 he was introduced to Stéphane Mallarmé. Mallarmé is famous for his almost inscrutable poetry, for his aesthetic philosophy called symbolism, and for the salons he hosted called La M Les Mardi, the Tuesdays. He invited Debussy to these exclusive gatherings where the composer sat shoulder to shoulder with some of the great writers and artists of his time. He and Mallarmé became friends. Mallarmé expressed himself in his poems by elevating the sound of the words and phrases, even at the expense of the content. The idea was to write in a way that approached the condition of music, which Mallarmé and many other poets believed was the most sublime of all the arts. Mallarmé's quasi-musical verses were meant to convey specific emotions to the reader. W.C. wanted to write music that conveyed emotion in a different way. Not the joy or passion we feel when we listen to Beethoven's Ninth or Handel's Messiah, but the feelings that stir us when we see a passing parade, when we watch a goldfish darting back and forth in a pond, when we find ourselves bathed in moonlight. With Mallarmé as his intellectual guru, something clicked. In the years from 1892 to 94, he wrote a brilliant string quartet and began work on his opera. And in the same burst of creativity, he wrote a 10-minute musical analog to Mallarmé's most famous poem, Afternoon of a Fawn, L'après Midi d'Enfant. We're not talking about Bambi here, folks. This is the fawn of Greek mythology who had the head and torso of a man, the horns and legs of, of a goat. The story Mallarmé tells in his poem is simple. One afternoon on a hot sunny slope of Mount Etna, a fawn is sleeping and dreaming of two beautiful nymphs. He wakes up, he lustfully but unsuccessfully pursues the nymphs, or maybe he's just daydreaming. He plays a long soliloquy on his flute, he attempts to resurrect the dream, and finally he goes back to sleep. Reading Mallarmé's poem, we're never sure whether the fawn is dozing and dreaming or in some stage of wakefulness. His poem allows a profusion of interpretations, leaving the reader free to savor the elusive yet vivid language, enjoy the playfulness of the erotic reveries, and pity the frustrated fawn. Paul Valéry considered this to be the greatest of all French poems. Debussy's prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn was written for a small orchestra with no singers. He was not writing a literal music transcription of the poem, but rather music that would suggest the mood, the atmosphere, the eroticism of the poem. It was first performed in 1894, on December 22nd. At the time, no one knew, but it was the day that modern music was born. I'll read a passage from my book. When Debussy's Fawn was first performed, it was considered by many to have revealed Debussy in a different light and to have brought something new to the concert hall. 
Was Mahler made responsible for this new departure in Debussy's music? Consider that after Debussy's immersion in Wagner, his exposure to the gamelan, his musical experiments with the verses of Banville and Berlin, and his ill-advised atte ill attempts to write for the larger public, he had not yet found his distinctive voice. But Debussy absorbed Mallarmé's symbolist philosophical musings for about two years before he began writing Prelude to the Afternoon of the Fawn, and the result was his, <coughs> excuse me, his musical breakthrough. How could it have been otherwise? A poem like Fawn can't be expressed in the language of Schubert or Richard Strauss. In his earlier compositions, Debussy ignored many rules of harmony, orchestration, and form, but he never found a way to break completely with musical orthodoxy until he passed into the symbolist realm of Stefan Mallarmé. I'll conclude with another pass passage from my book. The abolition of centuries of rules and traditions was Debussy's most important contribution to Western music. His great gift to composers was not to show them a new way to write, but to give them the freedom to write in a new way, their own way. Igor Stravinsky could feel secure in the rhythmic explosions of Petrushka and Rite of Spring. Bella Bartok could employ spicy harmonies from the folk music of Eastern Europe. Arnold Schoenberg, employing Debussy's gift of freedom, could destroy harmony completely and invent atonality. With the passage of time, Debussy's innovations became commonplace in the classical music, jazz, and pop songs of our day. But innovation alone doesn't guarantee immortality. Debussy's music survives because he has given us so many tonal images of eternal freshness and sublime beauty that leave us with a powerful desire to hear more. I'll take a few questions and I'll sign your books if you have any. That's the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening so quietly. <laughs> you have any questions here? What prompted What prompted me to write it? Mm -hmm. It's a long story that I'll have to keep short. <laughs> um, about 10 or 11 years ago, after I'd retired, I wanted to get back to writing. I'd always been a writer, but I'd never, I'd never written a book. But I was looking for possibilities for a book. And I thought that the world needed a new book on modern music, which was fun to read. And um, I did a lot of research. I worked on it for three or four years. I did a book proposal, I did, did a good deal of work, and finally realized that the book is too big for me at this age. <laughs> it was a lifetime project. And so I looked for something smaller, and by that time I had become very, very interested in WC. I'd written a sample chapter on WC for that book. And uh, I was interested in, in his music, of course, and in his life. And I did some more research and decided that would be my book. Anything else? Yeah, I had asked you about Massenet. Why wasn't he a French composer? He wrote that. Well, he was a very successful French yeah. composer. Yeah. I what? Mean, why didn't he speak? Why didn't he write an opera using the French language? Which he did. He did write in French language. Yeah. It was it was the way they used the French language in their. You know, I mean, Massenet's um, arias, I suppose, could sometimes be confused with Italian arias I mean, in certain ways. I mean, obviously, he had his own voice, but he didn't, uh, he wasn't so concerned about tailoring it for a naturalistic way to sing. Um, anyone else? Then we'll adjourn. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks again. Thank you, Thank you very much. much. Yes.